Lord, it is good for us to be here. Now, what do you say? Let us make booths. Come on. Let us be that habitation of the living God. That it would manifest, and what does it say? The glory of the Lord shone around them. Let us be that habitation that it bursts forth. We sang the song, let your spirit fall. Come on, we need the spirit to fall. We need those refreshings. But the spirit is already in you. It's already in you. And we need the presence of God. That's what it said, right? We need the presence. The presence that he desires is already in us, and he wants it to come forth out into his creation. Hallelujah. Like he said, my, my father was here a couple weeks ago. I, I'm sure for some of you it looks like a repeat. My girls remind me all the time, Daddy, you look like Pa. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I want to look just like my dad. I want to sound like my dad. <laughs> my other dad will be here in a couple weeks, and I'm going to have to apologize to him. I, I can't help it. I can't, I can't help it. <laughs> I'm going to have to apologize for stealing his idea, but it's not. it wasn't his, it was the Lord's. Hallelujah. But uh, I love that man. Uh, I love both my dads. you remember what he always used to say? I got the best dad in the whole world. I got him beat. I got the two best dads in the whole world. <laughs> but no, come on. I, I'm not an old man, but I'm not a young man either. I'm in a unique position, I feel, to, to you know, encourage you. To be like the Father. Come on, that the, the love that is growing, I can't explain to you the bond that I have with my, with my father-in-law and my dad, other than it's the spirit of Elijah that came to restore all things, and restore the hearts of the sons to the fathers and the hearts of the father to the son. Hallelujah. Uh, Uncle Stephen remembers uh, H1. H1. Come on, in the Strong's Concordance, it's not a coincidence. H1. Uh, Father. It's the principal, meaning first. It's the chief, the highest. Patrimony, the first of the family. Father. Hallelujah. And though it is awesome, I never realized it when I first said H1. Do you know what H2 is? It's Aramaic. Ah. Pertaining unto H1. Father. Come on. It's a father. <laughs> wants a second just like him, just like him. Come on, hallelujah. So I want to look, come on, I want to be like my dad. <laughs> and look, I've been blessed. I know not everyone has been as fortunate as I am to have two amazing natural fathers, but come on, every single one in this room is fortunate enough to have been born again. And what does he say in First John 5, verse 1? If any man believes that Jesus is the Christ, not was, is the Christ, he is born of God. He's born of God. That's our Father. That's my dad, and I want to be just like him. Hallelujah. All right, if you turn to me to uh, De Deuteronomy chapter 30. Hallelujah. And, uh, Hebrews Chapter 4, verse 12, in, in the English Standard Version, says the, the Word of God is alive. It's living and active. Yeah. Come on, the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, and it says piercing to the division of soul and spirit, but we know it's the piercing of the division, and the division is flesh, right? Come on, we have a forerunner, the firstborn brother, my brother, my older brother, went through first. He broke down the wall of partition. Yeah. He pierced the flesh. He rent the veil. Yes. And now we have hope as the anchor of the soul on the other side of the veil. It's not the division of the soul and spirit, but that the soul and spirit would become one. And that hope is on the other side of the veil as an anchor for our soul. And I, I want you to, when you read the word hope in the Bible, it's not wishful thinking. It's not some, I hope someday. No, it's an expectation. It'll change the way you read the Bible. It's an expectation that what he said will come to pass. The word of God is living and active. Hallelujah. Sharper than a two-edged sword. Hallelujah. So all right, in verse 11 here of Deuteronomy chapter 30, 
the context here is the giving of the law again, right? A witness to establish the thing. And in this portion, he's telling them, he's reminding them that if you follow my commandment, come on, there's only two commandments. What are they? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And the second, like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. So this is what he's telling them. This is the commandment that he's reminding them of, that if you do this, I will do it. That's what he's saying to them. And he reminds them, if you don't, that there are consequences. But come on, let's do it. He'll do it. So in verse 11, uh, he says, For this commandment, for this word, which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee. Come on, hallelujah. It's not hidden from us. In Colossians, we know the verse we quoted all the time. He said, it's the mystery hidden from the ages and the generations. Do you know how many generations have gone? Do you know how many people have gone and it's been hidden? But it's not hidden to us. Come on, somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's not a mystery. What does he go on to say? It was a mystery hid from the ages and the generations, but not from us. It is made manifest in the saints. Come on, he put it in our hearts. We know it. It's Christ in you. It is made manifest, apparent to everyone that God put himself in a man and showed himself to the whole world. Come on. We know this is Jesus, but this is our inheritance. This is what the Father has given us. This is our portion And this is our call to manifest him in the creation. It is the word made flesh. Come on. In the beginning was the word. And the word was God. It was with God. And the word was God. And he jumped down to verse 14. And the word was made flesh. Come on. That's all it's all about. It's all he ever wanted. And he has not stopped. The word of God is living and active. Hallelujah. It is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It's not where we can't reach it. Yeah. It's not somewhere we can't reach it. It's not something we can't perform. It is not far off. In that portion of John, one of the verses he said, to as many as believe on me, the power is given to them to be the sons of God. Come on. We had that power. We believe the word of God. We had the power to be the sons of God. Come on. Can you imagine being the son of the almighty God? That is the power that he's given us. Hallelujah. It is not hidden from us. It is not a mystery. It is not far off. Hallelujah. In verse 12, he says, It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? It is not in heaven. We need to change our concept of heaven. We, We know that the rapture is not the answer. We've been taught well. But I'm telling you that that spirit remains alive in the church. And it is the concept that we can just live a good, long Christian life, and that when I die, I have the consolation of heaven. It is not far off. It is not somewhere else. The problem with this is it relegates Jesus to another time and another place. And he's not in another place. Where is he? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And then he said that where I am, there you will be also. But where is he? You won't find it on a map. You can't. Hallelujah. We said it, Brother Ron said it this morning, or Brother Bud uh, chimed in this morning. I can't get it off my mind. They got in the boat, and they went across the sea, right? And a great tempest came up. Enough to make 12 grown men afraid for their lives. Can you imagine that storm? And yeah, where was Jesus? Sleep. 
Can you imagine a storm that's so big that 12 grown men fear for their lives, but will somebody sleeping in that boat? And they had to wake him up. Master, don't you, don't you know we're perishing? We are perishing. Come on, the outward man is perishing. But the inward man is renewed day by day. So they had to wake him up. And what did he say? Oh, ye of little faith. Come on. How was he asleep? Where I am, there you will be also. Yeah. And come on, what did he say? Peace? Be still. So I have a question for you. Why did he calm the storm? Was he afraid for his life? So why did he calm the storm? It's, it was for them. It was so that he could bring where he was into a physical manifestation in the earth. And what did the words say? There was a great calm. That's where he is. So I have another question for you. <laughs> so I have another question for you. Do you think he would have preferred to calm that storm? Or do you think he would have preferred to stay sleeping all the way to the other side and let them overcome? Come on, he's patient with us. He's patient with us. He lets us see. But I might be speculating, but I think he probably wanted to sleep the whole way across. <laughs> yeah, he didn't. He knew her. He was going to be there too. Listen up. He's already declared it. <laughs> don't don't fear don't fear for your lives don't fear for your lives we've already lost this life it's not ours anymore don't fear for it come on hallelujah all right so that's where he's not in another place we also relegate it to another time and we put it off in the future. And we know this. It says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. Yes. But we're waiting for it, right? Stop waiting. Yes. Stop waiting. Yes. Come on, Brother Ron, you said it this morning. What do we do with our children? Day by day by day by day. And what was the words you said? All of the sudden, in a moment. In a twinkling of an eye, 21 years. Where did the time go? Where did the time go? That's, a, that's something we say as human beings. Where did the time go? And we say it from a perspective of nostalgia. I have no problem. Nikita, 2013, that was an amazing year, right? You held that little girl for the first time. She just turned eight. Where did the time go? Come on, we look back at it as nostalgia, kind of sappy. Oh, it was so good. And it is true. I'm not, don't hold on to those. They're, it is precious. Those are precious moments. Like he said, what's ahead of us is greater than anything that is behind you. And so this is where God looks at it from. He says, where did the time go? But with God, the end is the same place as the beginning. And when he says, where did the time go? All of a sudden, Jesus says, it is finished. And the day that always was came bursting forth. Today. It's today. Come on, it was 4,000 some odd years. And if you look at it from the Bible perspective of the state of the church, it only got worse. But I'm telling you, that God was building something every day, day by day, step by step, to a point when he said, it is finished. Where did the time go? Where did it go? Come on. It's in him. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And not one of those days, come on, he was here, we think, about 33 and a half years. If you read all the accounts in the Gospels and everything that was written about him, even if it was 100 days, that is less than 1% of 33 years. What happened on the other 99% of those days? 
it didn't look like a thing was happening. And we know it didn't look like a thing was happening because he came to his own and they received him not. They didn't believe. What's that? That was the biggest crime ever. Yeah? Biggest crime in the Bible. They believed it. They, yeah? They didn't believe. So it still looked like nothing was happening. But not one single one of those days could have been removed. Every single one of them mattered. And what God was building, and this is how he's building the kingdom, it's every single day, day by day, step by step. Today is the day. Don't relegate it to another time. Don't relegate it to another place. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hallelujah. All right, in verse 13, he says, Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over us? The sea for us to bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. You can look across the entire sea of humanity. You will not find a man. You will not find a formula or a rule of man that can do this. You won't. Yeah, exactly. What did God say to Moses? No man can see my face and live. We know over in John, in the um, epistles, that he said, now we are sons, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. But when he does appear, we shall be like him. When we see him face to face, there's no more man, there's no more carnality, there's no more Adam. It's Christ in you. No longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. I only do what I hear the Father say. I only say what I hear the Father say. I only do what, what I see the Father do. Come on. Hallelujah. No, no man can see God and live. And we get over to Revelation chapter 5. Would you share with him that no man could open the book? It's the book of life. Come on, you are that book. It's written. It's written in us. An epistle for all men to read and to know him. No man can open that book. And you know, he wept. Then there was no man found worthy. And what did he tell him? Don't cry. The Lion of Judah has prevailed. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Lion of Judah has prevailed and has opened the book that it can be read of all men. Hallelujah. And what was the other thing he said in Revelation? He gave him a name that no man could know. This is not some secret name between you and God that it's the code we're going to use. No. The name is Jesus. And that name that we know to be so great is our inheritance. He has given it to us. It's his nature and his character that that is who we are and what we are called to be. It is not beyond the sea. There's no formula that men can, come on, we, we do this. We apply psychology and philosophy to the word of God, and we know how to quote the right scriptures, but we use the carnal mind, we make our own weapons out of it, and call it religion. But no man can do this. Hallelujah. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, who shall go over for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. This is the question that we ask. Just give, me, just give me the word and I'll, I'll hear it and I'll do it. No, men look for commandments for, to make themselves righteous. God said there is no commandment that could make you righteous. It only comes by faith. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the word of the Lord. And the word is living and active. Hallelujah. Come on. And the word was made flesh. Hallelujah. <laughs> and in verse 14, but the word is very nigh unto thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart, that thou mayest 
do it. <laughs> yep, exactly. Be it. In him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being. It is who we are. It is what he's desired for us. Hallelujah. If you turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 with me, I honestly don't know where the rest of this is going to go. <laughs> I have some ideas, but <laughs> ideas won't do it. <laughs> In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we know it to be the seasons. Can we just settle it? that all of the seasons are in God. He is able to be happy and sad at the same time. He is able to speak life and death at the same time. He is able to love and hate at the same time. It is summer, it is winter, it is spring, it is fall in God. And so all these seasons are in him. We pass through them, but they're all in him. And in verse 9, it says, What profit hath he that worketh in wherein he labors? In other words, what fruit does man have for all of his labor? That's what he's saying. What fruit do we have for all of our labor? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. It is the fellowship of his sufferings. He has seen it. He was tested in every way as man, yet without sin. I have seen the travail which God has given the sons of men to be exercised in it. He has made everything beautiful, that is to say perfect, full, complete, in his time. His time is eternity. Also, he has set the world in their hearts so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Again, no man can perform this work. What does it say? That God maketh from the beginning to the end. He said it earlier. He who started this work in you is faithful Amen. to complete it. It is God that does the work. It is not the labor of men that brings forth fruit. If you would turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. I originally thought that I was going to, the verse that I quoted to you at the beginning, verse 12, the word of God is living and active, was the sole premise of my message. I did not even realize it was in the context that it is. So let us read this. <clears throat> and I'm actually going to start. In chapter 3, when he's reprimanding them for being, you know, he said that it's a disobedient generation that I swore that they would not enter into my rest. And in verse 19, he said, so that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Do you remember in John chapter 16 when he said to them, they're going to throw you out of the church. And the ones that kill you are going to think they're doing me a service. He said, I didn't tell you this at the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going. Don't be sad. I have to go. It's better for you that I go. And he said he's going to send the comforter, right? And he, the comforter, he said, is going to come and it's going to reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And he said it's going to reprove the world of sin, because they believed not. Now, when I thought he was going to reprove the world of sin, man, I came up with a good list. I came up with murdering and stealing, cheating, lying, fornication, witchcraft, rebellion. Come on, you can name them all. They're written. No, there's only one thing he said. There's only one unbelief. Come on, the word of God is living and active. Come on, do we believe? Yes. Do we believe that it's active today? Boy, it sure doesn't look like it out there. Come on, stop believing what you see. Stop believing what you hear out there. I don't care what it looks like out there. I don't care what it looks like in here. I don't care what it looks like in here. 
The Word of God is living and active. It's performing His work. We could go 21 years with nothing happening, and all of a sudden we realize, oh, it was happening. Today is the day. Hallelujah. Do you remember this? He said, if thy eye offends thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. My whole life I grew up thinking that that referred to lust, primarily in the form of fornication. Sure, there's an application for that. But what about unbelief? What if your eye causes you an offense that causes you to unbelieve? Come on, we see what's going on in the world, and it causes us to waver. Close your eyes. Look with the Spirit. Close your ears. Here's what, hear what he's saying. Not my voice. Hear what he's saying. Come on, how do we hear what we hear? It's not hidden from us. He's shown it to us. Come on. Hallelujah. All right, in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Let us fear, let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well and unto them. Come on. We know the word we've heard, but there's other words in the world. There's other... There's other churches that have the word. Yeah. He, what did he say? His own received him not. It is. It's the worst crime ever. He came to his own and his own received him not. Come on, we have to receive him. It's been preached. And what does it say? The word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. The word of God is living and active. <laughs> Do you believe it? Yes. <laughs> Come on. For we uh, which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, the day that always was. Hallelujah. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again he limiteth a certain day, saying to David, Today. Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today if you will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts. For as Jesus had given them rest, then would not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest has also ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Come on, he said that God worked for six days. And then he ceased from his rest. Now he just needs man to cease from his works and enter in to God's rest. Come on, do you remember this when Jesus preached from the boat along the sea, or along the shore? And when he got done, he asked the boys, he said, Peter, push out into the deep and cast down the nets. And what did Peter say? Lord, we have toiled all night. Come on, we collectively, it's not for a lack of effort. It's not for a lack of trying to produce godly churches that are full. It's not for a lack of trying. We have toiled all night and taken nothing. The labors of men take Nothing. Let us enter labor to enter into his rest. And in that account, it was, Peter said these things not because of well, exasperation, but out of humility that, Lord, we've tried our best. We've tried our best and taken nothing. And he said the most important thing. Nevertheless, 
at thy word. <laughs> at thy word, we will do what you said. What did he say? He said manifest. He, come on, the word was made flesh. From the beginning, he put it, he decided to put it in mankind. At thy word, I will do it. Come on. Hallelujah. And they pushed out and they put down the nets. And come on, you guys, you mentioned it a little bit earlier. I don't even remember how you said it. But what's the greatest thing you could imagine happening in your Christian life? Your personal life, this church. What's the greatest thing you could imagine? Because whatever it is, is limited. That's not condemnation. He put us in this limited form. He put us in a limitation. But the almighty God, unlimited God, decided to limit himself so that he could express his greatness to the whole creation. <laughs> it's awesome. God. Whatever we're imagining that he's going to do is limited. It's short. Yeah, it is what you said. Now I remember. It. It, eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of man all that he has prepared for who? Those that love him. Come on, it's those that love his appearing. Yeah, it's better. Those that love his appearing will see it. Come on. It might not even be in this lifetime. It might not. But it's today. I don't, come on, I don't even fully understand that. But I know it's the word of the Lord. Come on, we're going to say, where'd the time go? <laughs> Hallelujah. They let down those nets. And, you know, they were, what do you think Peter was hoping to catch that night when he toiled all night? Probably enough fish to feed his family. Enough to sell in the marketplace, maybe. Yep. It's limited. What did they take? They had to call another boat. Come on, when we harvest the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to have to call another boat. Your vessel's not big enough to hold him. It's going to take a whole big number of people to express him. No. Come on, he, I toiled all night and have taken nothing. And while he was working out on that water, God spent that night gathering fish from all over that sea. How did he get that many fish in one spot? He was working. He was working. Yeah. He's working. The Word of God is living and active. Hallelujah. We don't see it for the night, but He's gathering. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into His rest and enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick, it's living, and powerful, it's active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Hallelujah. When I was thinking of this, what we do with man's labors, I couldn't help but think of Gideon. If you remember Gideon, well, what was it? He was in the time of the judges. There was no king in the land. And every man did what was right in the sight of his own eyes. And who was in charge? Midian. Does anybody remember what Midian means? Strife and contention, yes. It's where we live. That's the world we live in. Nobody wants to hear, they just want to fight. Every man does what's right in his own eyes, and now we all have the means to do it. <laughs> I go out there and express myself. 
Come on, that's what God wants to do. He wrote it in our hearts. He just wants to express Himself. And He's got the medium to do it. He's got a social network to express Himself in creation. <laughs> Jesus. Hallelujah. So where was Gideon? He was down in a depression, right? A wine press, a low area, a place of humility. And what was he doing? It's threshing wheat. Come on, we've been given the word of God richly in this house. It's not a mystery to us. Continue to thresh. Come on, because it's not a lack of labor. It's our labor. But he says, let us labor to enter into his rest. Let us thresh out the wheat that we would have the sustenance to perform his word. Hallelujah. So God called Gideon. He called him out. And he brought him. I won't, I'll skip some of the story here, but what did they do? They gathered 32,000 people. And the unbelievers were separated. The ones who are fearful. They can't. The word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Dividing. The first that is separated is the unbelief. Don't lose hope for them. We know how this story ends. Don't lose hope. Pray. Pray for them. But he separated the 32,000, and he said, still too many. Do you remember why he said? Because man would boast of his labors. We'd say we've toiled all night. Look what we did. Look at this church I've built. Look at this arena I've filled with all these people. No, it's too, it's too many. Come on, it's not judgment. It's not condemnation. This is what humans are. This is Adam. But it's not our end. That is not our hope. It's not our expectation. We have a hope. We have an expectation. And so we divided them again. And there was 300 people that had something written in their hearts that no man didn't make a bit of logical sense. There's no reason from man's perspective why you would have picked those 300, but God said, I will prove them. I will show you which ones it is. And he put it in their hearts, and though they were selected, and he gave them an instruction, go get in position, right? And we know it was the middle of the night, when they went and gotten in position, you ever tried to climb a mountainside? Right? You said they were on the hillsides, around the valley. You ever tried to climb a mountain in the night? Oh, yeah, and the torch that you got with you, you got to keep it covered in a pot? So you're going to climb a mountain in the night in the dark? Does that sound familiar? You feel like you're climbing a mountain in the night in the dark? But he's preparing the deliverance. And his instruction to them... What did he tell them to bring? Yeah. Bring a trumpet? Yeah. A pitcher? Yeah. A clay pot? A vessel? Yeah. And bring your light, right? Did he say bring a sword? I had to read it again. It doesn't say anyone in there, in there to bring a sword. Come on, we've made our own weapons. God's not moving fast enough. Let me put together a sword. I can find something in here. The carnal mind can find a verse to support it. And I'll use my sword. He said, he didn't tell him don't bring it. But it wasn't on the packing list. You, Uncle Tim knows what a packing list is. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It wasn't on the list. I don't need your sword. I don't need it. You remember over in the, in the Gospels at the Last Supper? He asked them a question. He said, do you remember when I sent you out without a money bag or a script or a mat to sleep on? Did you need anything? They said, no, nothing. We didn't need anything. And he said to them, now I'm telling you, take your money bag and your script. Sell your garment. Sell this. Your garment. This life. Sell it. And what do you tell them? Buy a sword. 
Peter and his zealousy. I love Peter. And his zealousy, he said, Looks, Lord, we have two swords right here. In the King James Version, Jesus says, It is enough. And I think there's probably an application there. But there's other translations that word it differently. We do know that two swords is all you would need. <laughs> the original and a light copy. <laughs> but there's other versions that I think translate it more accurately. The Living Bible, he says it with an exclamation point, almost an exasperation, enough. The Passion goes even farther and says, you still don't understand. He doesn't need a sword. He's telling you to buy a sword. Come on, it's that word. Made flesh. Buy a sword. It is how he brings his deliverance. So back in Gideon, well, I'm going to stay there in the gospel. So do you remember what happened in the garden after he prayed and they came to get him? Peter, in his zealousy, pulled his sword and said, this doesn't look right. I'm going to lay the word of God on him. And he cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest, which is interesting to me. <laughs> He caused unbelief, right? Hearing comes by the word of the God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so we use man's device to, to cause unbelief. And it's written two different ways in the passages. The, the first one, I don't remember if it's Luke or Mark, but he says, put away your sword, Peter. He that lives by the sword, he that lives by man's natural devices, will die by man's natural devices. And over in John, he says, Peter, put away your sword. Should I not drink the cup that my father gave me? <laughs> Boy, it didn't sound like this, what you were saying this morning. This doesn't look right. Does God know what he's doing? I better get my sword out and set this straight. Get behind me, Satan. Oh, come on, I love Peter. Peter's one of my favorite Bible characters. Because what does it say? When you are converted, <laughs> feed my sheep. Come on, he goes, feed my lambs. And then he says, feed my sheep, which are now Arneon. <laughs> it's mature. The first fruit. The one made strong for lifting. It's the same word. <laughs> Peter was converted. Hallelujah. He went to the cross, quite literally. Like Jesus did. <laughs> he went from, no, you're not going to the cross. Let me bring my sword out here. To, not my will, but thy will be done. And he laid down his life that the word of God could be fulfilled. Hallelujah. So Gideon, he gave him the instruction, told him to get in position. Not a sword among the bunch. But do you remember what the instruction was? When you hear my trumpet? Break your pot and blow your trumpet. And what did they shout? The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Why would they shout that if there wasn't a sword in the round? They were the sword. The 300 that were there were the word of the Lord made flesh, manifested. In the darkness, the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And there was a deliverance no one could imagine. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to back up just a little bit. Do you remember when, what the Lord told him? He said, Gideon, if you're still not sure, look, I'm sending you into a war without a weapon. Come on, if, if World War III kicked off, what would we do first? We'd go find some guns, right? <laughs> he said, no, nah, you're not going to need them. Hmm? What? <laughs> Are you sure this guy knows what he's doing? <laughs> you're not going to need them. But he said, so he told him, hey, if you're still not sure, you just go down there. And I'll reveal myself. You remember there was one Midianite telling a dream to another Midianite? What was the dream? A loaf of barley bread. Come on, Gideon had already threshed it out. 
And we know that barley is the first fruit. It is the company that goes first. It will hold down the hill. And it, what does it say? It laid waste to the tent of Midian. Strife and contention is a temporary habitation. It's temporary. The habitation of the Lord is eternal. Amen. It's, it's Amen. eternal. Amen. So the loaf of barley bread, the true word of God, rolled down the hill and laid waste. And so how was the actual deliverance brought? Did they kill any Midianites? Not at first. You, I'll leave out the rest of the story. But the original deliverance, it said every Midianite, they set their sword against their brother. It's where we're at. We bite and devour and kill. And I don't just mean in here. I don't mean in here. I mean the world, the strife and contention that's out there. We see it. We see it. I'm telling you, stop seeing it. <laughs> I know it don't make sense, but it's stop looking with your eyes. Stop listening with your ears. The world has an agenda. They have something they're trying to push, but it is temporary. It passes away. It's perishing. But the word of God is renewed in our hearts day by day. Don't stick your sword in there. You don't need to fashion any weapons. You don't need to set people straight. Come on, that's what we want to do. We have great ideas. We have great biblical ideas of how things should be. Yeah. And we want to set people straight with the sword of the Lord. I don't need your weapons, he said. Stop forming them. Stop trying to do it in your own strength. Labor to enter into my rest. God, hallelujah. We can't do it. We've toiled all night. Let us enter into his rest that it would fulfill the word from the beginning. They sang, she mentioned it this morning, uh, and we sang it when I was at my parents' church on Thursday out of Isaiah. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the eagle's wings. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. For their hope is in the Lord. Hallelujah. And the song, the old chorus that we used to sing, goes farther. It says, And the eyes of the blind shall be open. Come on, we've wanted to open some eyes with our sword. And set people straight. Let them see. Uh, look, look what I know. I don't need your sword, he said. And the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Hear me. <laughs> right? Same thing. I'm going to set people straight with my sword. I don't need your sword. And then it says, Then shall the lame man leap as a heart. And the tongue of the dumb shall speak. Come on, when we enter into his rest, things we didn't think were possible become possible. Because it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And in him, all things are possible. Come on, boo. We are the habitation of the Almighty God, the living temple of His Spirit, and all He wants to see is His Word made flesh. <laughs> it's not far off. It's not hidden from us. It's nigh unto us, even in our hearts and in our mouths, that we're able to perform it. We are well able to perform the word of the Lord. It's not ours, it's His. It's His. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> it is good to be here. Let, let us build a habitation. 
not with the labors of men, but with the word of the Lord.